Today we are doing part number two of Leadership Tag Team. Did you guys enjoy it last Sunday? Man, we're going to, um, I, told, uh, I told our staff uh, last week, I said, we got to bring our A game today because y'all brought some heat last Sunday. And so um, we, the whole topic or the whole reason why we, we are doing these um, little mini um, messages is because I believe and we believe every one of you guys are leaders. Amen. I get a whole lot of amens out there. How many, how many believe you're a leader? And this is why I believe you're a leader, because you influence someone. And leadership is influence. And you are a leader. Everywhere you go, you influence somebody. Whether you're a parent or whether you're an employee or an employer, you are a leader. And everybody needs to learn how to lead better. Amen. So we're going to learn how to lead better today. Y'all ready for this? Well, I want to open it up today with Miss Michelle Powers, amazing minister of the gospel, has been with us from the get-go. So give her a hand as she comes up. Thank you, Pastor. Well, let's start with prayer real quick, and then I'm really just going to read. Believe it or not, God says, you don't have time to elaborate, read. So he gave me little tidbits all through the couple last couple of weeks, and so really I just wrote them down. They're just kind of raw as the Spirit gave them to me, and that's just what I'm going to do. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you so much that you are such an amazing leader in our life, that Jesus was such an amazing leader when he was a man and lived on this earth, and we have so much uh, to glean from him, and he put his same Spirit in us, and so, Lord, all that he did, we can do also. And so, Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit is who is our helper. I thank you, Lord God, for all of us who will speak the word today. Lord God, that it will be anointed, that it will be as you would have us to say. And all those who are hearers of the word today, that their hearts are good ground and it comes into their hearts and stays a seed that will produce great harvest. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Who would you say is the greatest leader? Jesus. Well, that's because we know we're talking about leadership. <laughs> Jesus, because he was perfect in every way. But most of the time, when asked about Jesus' greatest qualities, leadership is not mentioned. I asked several random Christians the last couple of weeks what they thought was his greatest qualities, and here is the top five. Love and compassion, servant, obedient, giving, sacrificial. Pastor Chris talked about four of Jesus' examples, serving, giving, consistent, and empowering. We have talked about many of these qualities already, but why do you think we don't call them leadership? Maybe we don't want to set the bar of leadership that high. Maybe leadership is more about the followers than the leader. What can we learn from the greatest leader of all? Exampleship. Now, that is not an you're not going to find that in Webster's Dictionary, but it is in the spiritual dictionary. The Lord gave me this about three weeks ago. He said, exampleship. Leadership is exampleship. This is a new word, not found in, okay, no, I already said that. All of these qualities and much more are simply actions, and those are the qualities I just mentioned, that Jesus did every day and set an example for all to follow. John 13, 13 through 17, Pastor David shared about Jesus' serving last week. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their masters, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. The difference between good and great leadership lies in this. A good leader will seem bigger than life, while a great leader, who is no doubt bigger than life, will also be able to be your friend, relate to you, and be somebody you can trust. A great leader does not need to lord it over you. They are great leaders because they can assert their authority without needing to do it all the time. They can be your friends because they know exactly how to find that line between being your superior and being your ally. In fact, for them, they are often one in the same. We are a strong or weak leader. Uh, we are a strong or weak leader according to whether we are a strong or weak example. You heard Sarah say we are all leaders. That's because we are all setting examples. Truth is, we are all good and bad leaders because we are not Jesus, and we all have areas that are, we are good examples in, and we all have areas that we're not such a good example in. The kind of example we set is the kind of leadership we set. 
Allowing God to show us our com- uh, exampleship, correcting where needed, is an absolute in being a great leader. We need to ask the Lord to reveal to us where we are a good example and not so good example. As he reveals those things, we can be confident, as Pastor Mike ministered, that we are equipped to be great examples. Miss Gabby shared about personalities and how we have good and bad traits, but not to let our natural weakness be, uh, to be an excuse for poor exampleship. Jesus set the example in every way and, his, and was great at exampleship, therefore being, a great, being great at leadership. He obeyed and followed every instruction of his father, which was his leader. He served all, gave all, honored all. He showed them what to do and how to do it. He empowered his disciples to do the same things he did. He led them to uh, the power source. He wanted them to do greater things than he did. He showed no partiality to those who followed him. He gave Judas the same as the others, even after he knew that Judas, Jesus, Judas was not going to follow his exampleship. So we can all be encouraged today. Not even Jesus had 100% success with those that he led. <laughs> Know that not everyone will follow your example, but we still have to set the example. What is leadership? Responsibility and accountability. Again, we set the example. No partiality in your leadership. Give the same to all. Be the same example no matter who you're with. Great leaders learn to prioritize their responsibilities. Define your responsibilities. Discern what is priority and when. Great leaders can adjust immediately to priority changes. Great leaders stay within the boundaries of their assignment. Jesus was the son of God, but his boundaries kept him operating as the son of man. He even told his mother it wasn't his time. He is the king of kings, but his boundaries 2,000 years ago were the lamb of God slain as a sacrifice. Great leaders don't take over someone else's assignments and responsibilities. They equip them to succeed in their assignments. Philippians 2, 4 through 9, abandon every display of selfishness, Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interest. And consider the example that Jesus, the anointed one, has set before us. Let his mindset become your motivation. He existed in the form of God, yet he gave no thought to seizing equality with God as his supreme prize. Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant. He became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. He was a perfect example, even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God exalted him and multiplied his greatness. He has now been given the greatest name of all times. Our leadership is only as good as our servant, uh, as our exampleship. Our leadership is only as great as our exampleship. Last thought, and this comes from Thomas Yoakum. He was in a conference this weekend, and it's not a leadership conference, but every se- session he was sending me his thoughts, his greatest, his greatest revelations, and it just went perfectly with what the Lord had already given me. After three years of constant revival and so many miracles, there wouldn't be enough books to contain it. The disciples' one request was, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, not how to heal, not how to have faith or work miracles. The greatest thing was having a relationship with the Father. And out of all the leadership skills, the greatest leader could give, that was the best thing that he could give. Great leaders know what the, great, what the greatest assets for accomplishing the assignment is, and they provide it. Provide the secret to your success with those who follow you. Provide a path for others to do great things. Don't be a stumbling block leader or example. This is, a very, this is in every area of life. Set a good godly example in your home, place of work, in the marketplace, friendships, church, everywhere to everyone. Let Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit, his helper, our helper. He is the perfect exampleship in our lives. We can do this because Jesus did it. Great job. Great job. All right. Well, I'm Pastor Rowe, and I'm just going to kind of go over what God gave me was the cost of leadership. I think sometimes we forget that there's a cost associated with it, right? There's something that you're going to have to pay. And um, I, I'm a movie junkie, right? If you guys seen any of the Avengers, Thanos is asked, what did it cost you? And his response was everything. 
Well, let's, you know, we're looking at the life of Jesus and what did it cost him to lead? Everything, right? When we look at it, most of the time we see leadership like the top here, right? You go, oh man, you're all dressed up all nice and snazzy, but we forget about all the holes. We forget about all the pain. We forget about the suffering. We forget about the serving that has to go with it, right? We, we always want to stand behind here and just say, hey, this is what leadership is. This is what, what it takes to lead. You have to look like this. But in order to look like this, you have to go through this, right? See, leadership is not so much do as I say, do this, do that. Leadership is more like this, right? Leadership is more of I'm down here. I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to put my needs below your needs. Not my will, but your will be done, right? So as we look at the life of Jesus, we notice a couple things. He was a suffering leader, right? So he suffered, but he was also a reigning leader, right? He wore two different crowns. He wore the crown of thorns, right? Because he was ridiculed. He was um, belittled by man, but he also wore a crown of jewels where those that followed him worshiped. They praised him. So you're going to go through some things. And I just want to kind of encourage you, ships should take you places, right? Like leadership. If a leader is not taking you somewhere, then you shouldn't be following them because you're going nowhere, obviously, right? My favorite quote is, true leaders don't create followers. They create more leaders. And as we look at Jesus, we notice something, right? He created, yes, he had many people follow him, but he created disciples. And the last thing at his life, he said, was the Great Commission was go out and teach, right, and create disciples. Because if you look at Jesus' life, he was the best leader, right, 100%, not even argument. But if you look at Matthew 20 and 29, verse 29, um, everybody followed him, they loved him. But if you look at his burial, burial when he was on the crucifixion, Matthew 26, 56, there were only a few people there. The multitudes weren't there. Even most of the disciples weren't there. There were just a few people that were there. People, you can be the best leader in the world and people will still leave you. Right? You can be the best leader in the world and you'll have lots of followers but few friends. Right? You, you will. That's the way it works. That's the way it's designed because that is the cost. When you, when you buy a luxury car, right, you get something nicer, but you know you got to put premium in it, right? Your fuel is going to cost more. Your maintenance is going to cost more, right? You go over there and you go get a base model. It's pretty cheap, 10 grand. It's easy to fix that thing, right? Because it didn't cost much to put together. But leadership has such a high price to pay. You must pay the price to lead. Jesus came out of his best season, right? And he was up into the wilderness to be tempted. He just came out. He just got baptized. The dove descended on him and said, this is my son in whom we are well, I'm well pleased. And then the enemy immediately comes. As a leader, you will go through your best season and then your worst season will come. The temptation will come, right? The the things will attack your character will come. Those things will come and try to get you to quit. If you've ever been leading anything, you've had this thought, is it really worth it? Am I really the one to do this? Am I qualified? Am I good enough? All those thoughts will come through your head. But yes, you are good enough. Yes, you can do it. And yes, you do have to pay the price. And sometimes it sucks. It sucks. Usually when you're paying the price, it's not good. Right? Who's ever been happy to pay their taxes? Who's been happy to pay the bills every single month? You've been happy to be able to, but no one's like, yes, I really wanted to spend that money on that toilet that had to be fixed. Right? Man, I really, oh, that is so awesome that my car broke down there. I got to fix it. Yes. No one's happy about that. But that's some of the things that happens. Um, You can know the outcome and still grieve. You can know, like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew that he was going to be raised in three days, right? He knew, but yet he still went through the emotions that went with it. As a leader, you can know everything's going to be okay and still 
grieve and still go through it. It doesn't make you any less. Things can suck. And when you're starting something, right, that's usually when it sucks the most. And I have to use that word because suck means to pull, right? And it does. It drains your emotions. It drains things out of you. That's a cost. Um, and you will be alone sometimes in your greatest time of need. In the garden, he had the disciples, right? And he said, if you could just pray with me. And he came back and said, if you'll pray. And what were they doing? Sleeping. Did he say, see, look, I knew I couldn't count on y'all. Y'all never there for me. You always let me down. Y'all supposed to be my followers. How y'all going to follow me and y'all sleep? No. He went back, prayed, did what he had to do. Because people will let you down. That's a part of it. But it's how you respond to what happens. Right? Um, and you will be asked to do things before your time, before you're ready. As a leader, Jesus, right? His mother said, hey, we out of wine. Can you fix this? He says, uh, mom, it ain't my time yet. It ain't my time to do miracles. But nevertheless, because you asked at your request, I'm going to do it. When it's not, sometimes you're not ready for what you're going to be asked to do. And as a leader, you step up and you do it, right? That is the call. And you may go, well, I don't lead anybody. If you have a family, if you have children, if you have siblings, if you have a mom, you have a dad. Well, everybody got a mom and dad. So you're leading someone, right? You're leading someone. And that cost, right? Sometimes you go, man, we ain't got enough food for everybody. I guess I'm the one that don't eat, right? Well, a trait of a true servant leader is leaders eat last. Everyone else is taken care of first. Everyone else, and then you get what's left. Sometimes it's a bigger portion. Most of the time, it's not. It's usually the crumbs, right? That's usually how it works. Um, you'll be criticized by opposition and your friends. Look at Jesus. The, Sa the Sadducees and the Pharisees criticized them. Remember when Peter said, Lord, be not so that, you know, this should happen, that you should go to the death. And what did he say? Get behind me. You don't know the mission. You don't, you haven't seen the vision that I've seen. So therefore, I have to tell you, I can't stop just because you think it's the wrong thing to do. And as a leader, people are going to tell you it's not the right thing to do. And you have to go on with the mission. The mission must always come before everything else. And it's not because you don't love the people, but without the mission, there's no one to take with you, right? There's nowhere to go. So if you're not going anywhere, then there's no one following you. If I stand here, I don't have any followers. There's nobody behind me, right? Like if you get on Twitter or Facebook or anything, you got followers. Well, when you post, they like something or they tag or, or they do something with it. You, you won't have many followers if you don't have any activity. As a leader, you must generate activity. You must do something. Um, the greatest leader was the greatest servant but he also showed the greatest amount of mercy, right? He loved people. He loved them. Even Judah, Judas, sorry, Judas, right? He, he knew that Judas was going to betray him before he even called him into the ministry. Yet he still called him. Love always gives an option. Leadership knows you may betray me, but I'm still going still gonna to call you. I'm still going to give you an opportunity. I'm still going to give you a chance, right? But leaders always lead from the front, never from the back. A boss will lead from the back. But a leader says, let's go, and they're leading the charge. It's not about being in charge, but who's in your charge. Who are you responsible for? As a leader, you carry that weight of going, I am responsible. Not just me. That's why it's easy to not lead, right? People think leadership is easy. It's not. It's easier to be responsible for me and mine only, right? But what about when everybody else is counting on you? What about will you let them down, right? When you can do it, when you're very capable of doing it. Um, if everything goes well, then the team gets the credit. If it does not go well, as the leader, you take the responsibility and you take the blame. 
It's not their fault, not their fault, not their fault. It's yours. Maybe I didn't convey it correctly. Maybe I didn't. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you don't point the finger at anybody but yourself. That's what the leader does. A true leader steps up and says, it's me. That was me. Well, my, no, it was me. And you fall on the sword. You always fall on the sword. And we see that in Kings and Chronicles where it says that the king made the people to sin. Right? Your actions affect so many more. And with leadership, it is a high cost, but it is a high reward. It is very rewarding. When, you see, when Jesus knew that the disciples would leave him and Peter would deny him, he told Peter, you're going to deny him. Peter said, no, he denied him. And yet we see that Jesus specifically said, tell my disciples and Peter that I love them. And then he went to go talk to Peter and make it right. Why did he go make it right when it was Peter who had wronged him? Because that's what a true leader does. A true leader will always go fix it, will always go change what has been broken, will always correct what has been wrong. A true leader rises to the occasion, no matter what's going on. Leadership must always exist because there has to have a command structure. Without a command structure, the army falls apart. Jesus is ultimately the head. Then we have our pastors, right? And then there's our everybody underneath. But without that order, things fall apart. And when we ask, you know, people to lead, most of the time people only look at that cost. But remember on the other side of the crucifixion, three days later, there's the resurrection, right? And after that resurrection, he said he did at the right hand of the Father, where all power and authority is. See, when you go through the crucifixion, the, the trials and the cost of leadership and pay that price, there's always the reward, right? The CEO always makes more than the employees, right? That is the design, but not originally. The boss starts off when he starts the company making less than everybody else. But eventually, after paying the price long enough, doing enough long enough, doing the right things and taking care of his people and those that are in his charge, he is rewarded. So I'll leave you with that last thought. Amen. Good word. All right. Well, if you would like to open your Bibles with me to uh, a letter that's right before Hebrews called Philemon. This little small letter, it's fascinating because it really is just a letter from the Apostle Paul to this man. It's not written specifically to a church like we see all the other letters. But like with anything in the Word of God, God saw a reason, saw fit why it should be put in His Word for us. So let me give you the backstory of what's going on here in Philemon. So Philemon had been one of Paul's co-workers in ministry, uh, a person who led a house church in the city of Colossae. Uh, and apparently Philemon owned a slave who stole from him and ran away, and his name was Onesimus. Now, later, Onesimus was uh, arrested, and he was imprisoned, and just by chance, I'm sure God's chance, he was put in a cell right next to the Apostle Paul, who led him to the Lord. Now, when Onesimus was released from prison, Paul sent him back to Philemon, carrying this letter that we're about to look at, asking his former master to fully receive and restore him as a fellow believer. Now, this was a big deal because a runaway slave could be punished by death according to Roman law. So this was risky, right? But Paul not only asked Philemon to forgive him, but also love him as a brother returning home. So let's look at a portion of this. I'm going to start in verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Therefore, Though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. Being such a one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, 
but now is very profitable to you and me. Now, verse 8, I want to read in a couple of translations. The New Living says, That is why I am boldly asking a favor of you. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it's the right thing for you to do, but because of our love, I prefer simply to ask you. The message translation says, in line with all this, I have a favor to ask you. As Christ's ambassador and now a prisoner for him, I wouldn't hesitate to command this if I thought it necessary, but I'd rather make it a personal request. And then Amplified says, therefore, though I have abundant boldness in Christ to charge you to do what is fitting and required and your duty to do, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. And so there are many lessons in this letter But the one I want us all to see today is that we should always lead with love. So love is so often misunderstood in leadership. It is not namby-pamby. I looked that up, and I need to tell you, I thought, it it dropped in my spirit. It's not namby-pamby. And I was like, what does that even mean, namby-pamby? It actually means weak and indecisive. And it was uh, 100 years ago, it was a couple of poets who didn't like the way another, I didn't get their names for you, but you can go Google it. They didn't like how this one poet wrote. They felt like he was always just real, real squishy, real soft, and they wanted, you know, him to be harder and more direct. And so they they wrote their own poems and and made fun of him and called this character Namby Pamby. <laughs> and so that has just been uh, trickled down from uh, then on till now. But I think sometimes we think love in leadership is weak and indecisive, Namby Pamby, but it's anything but. Love is strong. Love knows what is right, but allows for growth. Love is aware of its responsibility and reflection of God towards others. So, for example, I send a lot of emails back and forth to our administration, administrative staff because if you don't know that, I don't have an office here at this building. And, uh, and so we do a lot of our communication by email. It's just better that way. And it would be easy for me to just say, send an email, do this, do that, do this, do that, and, and they would do it. But instead, uh, it's just my nature to say, can you please do such and such? You know, I'll send them an email. Now, I'm not really asking, even though it has a question, I'm not really asking, can you? Will you maybe, please, right? What am I doing? I'm showing respect, and I'm showing love. In leadership of any kind, even in the home, kindness and respect go a long ways. And say please. Say thank you. I don't think it's above the leader. If anything, as we've already heard this morning, it's the example of the leader. If your children don't say please and thank you, I bet they don't hear it from you. Hmm? And so you could demand it, but even God doesn't demand anything of us. God appeals to us in love, and we should do the same. 1 Corinthians 16, 14 in the Amplified says, Let everything you do be done in love, true love to God and man, as inspired by God's love in us. So everything that we do should be inspired by God's love in us. Now, look at verse 9. We're still in Philemon. It says, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. Now, this word appeal, uh, by definition, it means to exhort in a way of encouragement. But how many of you know in law, what is an appeal? An appeal describes something that is brought from a lower court to a higher court, right? That's where we often hear that term appeal. Did you know that's what love does? It exactly does that. It takes something from a lower standard to a higher standard, right? And so Paul knew that he could, he could demand Philemon to do the right thing. He could tell him, I charge you. I could demand this. I could command you to do this, but I prefer to ask you. Look at verse 13 and 14. In the Passion Translation, it says, I would have preferred to keep Onesimus at my side so that he could take your place as my helper during my imprisonment for the sake of the gospel. However, I did not want to make this decision without your consent so that your act of kindness would not be a matter of obligation, but out of willingness. See, a leader doesn't, I don't want to demand you to do something and just because it's your duty, you'll do it. I want it to be a willing partnership that we're working towards the same goal and love leads. Everybody say love leads. The new King James says, I didn't want to ask you by compulsion, but I wanted it to be voluntary. You see, love provokes others to love, even in leadership. Only insecure leaders feel the need to demand others to comply with their requests. We don't need to be insecure. We can be confident. And then verse 21 says that very thing. I'm writing to you with confidence that you will comply with my request and do even more than what I am asking. 
You see, in any kind of leadership, if we set the example and hold the standards, then we can have confidence. We should have confidence, actually, that those we are leading will comply and guess what? Do more than requested. Why? Because when they are motivated by love, then their natural response is, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do a little extra. Why? Because I feel loved and I want to love in return. And that's just the best way to lead. Love always wants to do more. Love, God's love in us, always goes above and beyond. Isn't that how God's love is? To us, above and beyond, exceedingly abundantly above what we could ever ask or think. That's God. Amen? So his love in us should motivate us to do the same. Now, on a side note, parents respect breeds respect. I think uh, I looked up this definition and respect means giving particular attention to. And a lot of times we see this generation, sadly, and I think it's just part of uh, the last days that we're in, but we don't see a lot of respect in this generation. But we can change that in our homes, especially as Christian homes. We can change that by respecting. What do I mean? I'm not saying that you don't go in their room. I'm not saying you don't check their phone because love also protects. Love protects, right? But love also respects. And so we need to show respect. And I think this actually applies to every one of us because if we will create an atmosphere of respect, we will be respected. Amen. We'll say please and thank you. Amen. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, Paul said this in his letter, As a prisoner of the Lord, I plead with you to walk holy in a way that is suitable to your high rank given to you in your divine calling. With tender humility and quiet patience, always demonstrate gentleness and generous love toward one another, especially toward those who try your patience. Be faithful to guard the sweet harmony of the Holy Spirit among you in the bonds of peace. So I'll just close with this. We need to lead with love in your homes, uh, in your workplace. As we've heard over and over, we are an example And so even students here today, you're an example in your school. You're an example among your friendships. And so we need to lead with love. So remember this, love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to others. Love does not brag about one's own achievements, nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter, for it never stops believing the best of others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. In fact, love never stops loving. I I love you. Somebody say chicken enchiladas. <laughs> Turn to Psalms 139, verse 14. You guys enjoying this? Amen. Today, I'm going to talk, obviously, about leadership, but specifically, as you're turning to Psalms 139, verse number 14, look at your neighbor and say, do you. Find somebody around and say, do you. I'm going to do a very basic teaching on leadership. And one of the things that I've learned about a leader is um, for me to be able to lead others, I have to be secure in who I am. Um, one of the greatest mistakes that leaders make is when they're afraid to have to make decisions or they're afraid of the responsibility that comes with leadership. But when you're secure in who you are and who God's created you to be, it's easy to lead. Let your neighbor again say, do you. Hallelujah. Psalms 139, verse 14. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. I want you to know that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. God made you who you are. Hallelujah. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are his works. You are marvelous. Amen. You are wonderful, and you are fearfully made. Now, in context of this scripture, this is King David. 
And King David was making this statement, I will praise you because he was secure in who he was. Because he knew he was fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. Now, you know your soul is your will, mind, and emotion. It's one thing to lead just because it's something that you're called to do, but it's a whole other thing whenever your soul is incorporated or infused into the whole leading process. Whenever you make a decision, it doesn't make sense in your mind. When you have to make a decision for somebody, it affects how you feel about that person. But notice something here. Jesus, our, our King David, said that I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and my soul knows that. There's a confidence that he had as a leader. He knew his will, mind, and emotions lined up with the very fact that he was fearfully and wonderfully made and that God saw him as marvelous. Amen. Amen. So how do you do you? As a leader, how do you do do you? Number one, you write this down. Work on your weaknesses. Hallelujah. A good leader will always, a great leader will always recognize and work on his own weaknesses. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9. says this, And he said to me, this is the Apostle Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So Paul, he was making some powerful statements here. He was actually talking about how God was even talking to him. And Paul recognized he had weaknesses. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Hallelujah. Even though you might feel weak in certain areas as a leader, God's grace is sufficient for you. That in your weakness, he will make you strong. But there's something else you must know about working on your weakness. Get around people that do it better than you. If you're going to be a great leader, get around, get around great leaders. Get around people that do it better than you. In fact, before Paul had all the accomplishments that he had, in fact, he wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. He was mentored by Barnabas. He had just had the, you know, the revelation on the road to Damascus. He turned Saul to Paul, and he was hanging out with, with uh, Barnabas, who was a tremendous mentor in his life. And Paul recognized, he knew the Bible, he was a scribe, he knew all the scriptures, he knew all those kind of things, but he recognized the need to be around somebody better than him. And, Paul, and Barnabas was that person that was in Paul's life that mentored him at the very beginning. I want to say this, if you're a welder, if you're a, you know, a salesman or whatever, the only way that you're going to be a better leader is by getting around better welders, better salesmen, better farmers than you. Now, I, I, I want to just kind of get where you live today. If you think that, that you are the best, you got a problem. If you think that there's really not anybody better than what I do, you have a problem. Because there will always be somebody better than you. Amen. Just seek out, search out those that are better than you. Now, I'm not asking you to be the best friend or the best welder if you're a welder or the best friend or the best farmer out there. No, just learn from them. Lean on their guidance. Learn how they do things. You know, you don't have to follow around the best salesman for very long to figure out why he or she's the best salesman. If you're going to be the best, get around people that do it better than you. It's a scriptural principle that Paul, who again wrote so much of the New Testament, who did crazy amounts of miracles, learned that from the get-go. He got around Bartimaeus, and he learned from him. Amen. So how do you do you? Get around somebody that does it better than you. How do you work on those weaknesses? Get around somebody that's better than you. Number two, how do you work on those weaknesses? How do you do you? Strengthen your strengths. Strengthen your strengths. If you always do it the way you've done it, you'll never outgrow it. Let me say it again. If you always do it the way you've done it, you'll never outgrow it. I like that. i got to say it again. If you, if you always do it the way you've always done it, you'll never outgrow it. So if you're, strength, if you're strong in one area, it doesn't mean that you can just stop right there and say, I'm good. No, strengthen your strengths. Write this down. Today's excellence is tomorrow's mediocrity. 
Today's excellence is tomorrow's mediocrity. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 4, the soul of the lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. In Philippians chapter 3, verse number 12, Paul, he said this, not that I've already attained or already perfect, but I press on. Somebody say, I press on. That I may lay hold for that which Christ has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehend, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He was strong in areas, but that didn't cause him to stop being strong. He continued to live out his strengths. Today's excellence is tomorrow's mediocrity. Let me define mediocrity. It's a state of moderate quality, not very good. Here's some words that describe being mediocre, ordinary, average, middle of the road, uninspired, indifferent, unexceptional, unexciting, unremarkable, amateur. God doesn't want us to live a mediocre life. He doesn't want us to have mediocrity in us. So whether you have weaknesses that you're working on or strengths that you're becoming stronger in, just know, refuse to be mediocre. Look at your neighbor and say, you are not ordinary. Find somebody else around and say, you're not ordinary. God created us an extraordinary people. We are his royal priesthood, a holy nation who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. There is nothing ordinary about God. And we're his children. We're his family. So we should not accept ordinary mediocre. Amen. Even in your strengths, your strengths, my strengths can be strengthened. Here's some phrases to help you understand a little bit more about mediocrity. Mediocrity shouts on Sunday, but doubts on Monday. Mediocrity is willing is the willingness to accept the ordinary because I am unwilling to work for the extraordinary. Whatever you compromise in, you'll eventually lose. And how many has ever said this? Someday. Someday is not a day of the week. It won't get done if you keep saying someday. That's just a, that's another word for mediocrity. Am I preaching real good at you today? Are you looking at me like a cow to Newgate? <sighs> Amen. Now, how do we strengthen our strengths? Number one, write this down. Keep your heart clean. As a leader, keep your heart clean. As a leader, keep your heart clean. There's going to be many things that you're going to have to say and do, but as a leader, you've got to keep your heart clean. In Psalm chapter 51, verse 10, Paul said this, um, excuse me, David said this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Keep your heart clean. People are going to say things and do things that will offend you, but keep your heart clean. Come on, somebody, keep your heart clean. Hey, hey, keep your heart clean. Amen. Number two. How do you strengthen your strengths? Check up on what you've been speaking. First step that I always check on my leadership whenever things don't get done right or things are not done is how did I communicate vision? Amen. So Romans chapter 10, verse number 10, with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We are a people that believe in confessing God's word. We believe in the power of our voice. So as a leader, if you're seeing negative things happen or you're seeing positive things that need to be reinforced, check out what you've been saying. If you're saying negative things about your team, your team will have negative response. If you speak positive things about your team, guess what? Positive things will eventually start taking place. Amen. So as a leader, check up on what you've been saying. Check on what you've been speaking. And lastly, which is the most important, I believe, fact about leadership, is you must always, somebody say always, always draw near to God. No matter how busy your life becomes, no matter how many people you manage, how many decisions that you make on a daily basis, and how wore out you are because of all of that, you must force your flesh to draw near to God. Psalm chapter 73, verse 28, but it was good for me to draw near to God. I put my trust in the Lord that I may declare all your works. So regardless of what 
area of responsibilities you have in life, leadership is influence. And if you do those three things, keep your heart clean, check up on what you've been saying, and draw near to God, you will see your team that you lead change for the better. You'll see weakness leave. You'll see your strengths be strengthened. Keep your heart clean. Check up what you've been saying. Draw near to God, and you'll lead effectively. Amen. Did you guys get anything today? Good times in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Did you take those principles, apply it to your life, and I believe that God will um, change you from the inside out. Amen. Look at your neighbor one more time. Say, do you. Find some restaurant and say, do you. What I mean by that, work on the weaknesses in your life, strengthen your strengths, and you'll be a great leader. Come on, let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for today. We thank you for your word. We're so grateful for all that you've done for us today. And Lord, we know that you've placed your anointing inside of us. We thank you, Lord. It is an honor. It's a privilege to influence people. And Lord, we know that, again, that anointing on the inside of us helps us influence and help others around us. So Father, all the principles that were given today, all the things that we've talked about for these two messages, we choose to be doers of the word and not just hearers. We believe that those words are seeds sown in our spirit and will be forever changed, transformed into your image, into your likeness. So we give you glory, Lord. We give you honor for all that you're doing in this place. In Jesus' name. With everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here today and whether it be through worship or whether it be through just the word or even during the offering, you just had this little pull on your heart that, man, I need to get my life right. My life has not been what I know it should be. I haven't been living for the Lord. Maybe you never prayed a simple prayer. Jesus, come into my heart. Take away my sin. I want to know with full assurance that I'm going to heaven and not hell. If that's you today, or if you're watching online, I want to give you an invitation to come on into the family of God. If that's you, just raise your hand wherever you're at. If you're watching online, and say, I need Jesus. I, I, I need that assurance that I'm going to heaven and not hell. I've fallen away. I'm like the prodigal child who's run away from God and I want to come back home. If that's you, just raise your hand real quick. If there's anybody here today, hallelujah. Well, for the sake of those that are watching online, everybody here in this place, just put your hand over your heart and just repeat this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you today. I'm so grateful for your son, Jesus. I recognize that he died on the cross and on the third day he rose again. He took away my sin. He called me to be a new creation in him. So today, I confess my sin. I ask you to forgive me, Jesus. I ask you to take away all my sin. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Today is a new day for me. The past is gone. A new life has begun. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, 